Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Chatterbox Declares podcast, where we like to chat, having a good discussion about the topics, the the betterment, uh, uh, mindfulness, you know, all the topics of the day, and and what we're into. And today is especially something uh, that our panelists today are very into. With us, as usual, is Tears of Mason, a a, a fan of poetry, and and you write a little bit as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> are we not talking yeah, about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and with us is uh, uh, Richard St. John. He's a poet himself, and uh, he also has uh, ex- experience in nonprofit management and community development. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit? What's what your Thank background? You. A little more about your background here? Oh gosh, uh, it's it's a long that's a long grim story, <laughs> but uh, in, in but, a nice uh, tight in a, in podcast a, form. <laughs> in, a, in a nice short form, I you know worked for about uh, 25 years in community development with nonprofit uh, uh, organizations, particularly in Pittsburgh's distressed neighborhoods, uh, and then had a wonderful chance to go off and do a one-year fellowship and came back and did a project called Conversations for Commonwealth, which actually used poetry as a focal point for uh, reflections in which small groups of people got together to think about um, what's my contribution to our shared common life? And poetry was an important part of that because it it got people thinking not about, oh, well, we ought to fix this policy thing or we mm-hmm. the government ought to do this or these people ought to do that, but it got it humanized the conversation so that people could think about where am I in the middle of this mm-hmm. and how do I need to change and how might I step up? Uh, and then... Uh, after working on that project, project I worked for about five years at a non, wonderful nonprofit press, Autumn House Press, based in Pittsburgh and publishing nationally. And uh, now I'm on to some new directions here. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I guess the first thing, uh, you know, I, I'm not uh, obviously not as into poetry as you guys. I read a little bit, a little mm-hmm. bit. Basically, a, a friend of mine, I give him a plug, thoughtfulriot.com. I enjoy it. You can tell me. Um, well, why are you guys so into poetry? Why, why is it that important to you guys? Yeah, this is a really fun place to be in, a relationship to you, Mike, because Mike is the media geek here, mm-hmm. okay? We're the poetry geeks here. With your words on paper. <laughs> <laughs> geek out of poetry, that's what we're doing today. Um, why poetry? Why, why is poetry important to us? Um, mm-hmm. Well, um, I think I've been always reading poetry a little bit throughout my life, and, and certain, some, some poetry that I read in school was daunting and couldn't figure out what it meant and all that, and we had to memorize, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, Robert Frost the, and the Raven. You know, Poe is actually a relative of mine. Um, so really? Yeah, yeah. Something like a great, 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 great grand. I have some friends some I'll sort. geek out over that fact. Uh huh. Yes, my uh, <laughs> my um, uh, my mother's maiden name was Poe. What? So uh, there's a distant relation there. So uh, I always like the Raven just because of that. <laughs> That's a great poem too. But um, poems, why do I like poems? Um, I guess in, in the last maybe five, six, seven years, um, poetry has become the thing I'm most drawn to, to understand myself, to do my soul work. Um, as I said in a, a retreat we had recently, uh, that, that poetry is the language of the soul. And uh, at a certain point in our life, uh, the language of the soul gets to be the language that, that we're most concerned with. And I'm at that point in my life. So um, that sounds pretty heavy, and sometimes it, it is, but other times it, it's light because the soul doesn't have actual weight. And sometimes to just uh, to float in that soul world of lightness is, is a way of getting there, a vehicle of getting there is poetry for me. So that's kind of what it's about for me. Well, I'll, I'll just pick up from where Tirza was because I, I think she's really right on target for me and I mean my sense of poetry is it's really a it's kind of distilled human experience Mm -hmm. felt human experience and so you know if you want to sort of learn how to make a table you know you might go to a blueprint and see you know how many feet of board feet you need to make a table and where you slice to sort of put the legs on and the you know kind of work you might do to put a table together but poetry instead is going to give you the human experience of a table you know what's it really like to touch a table or what's it like to go back to your old house and see a table that was the table you always ate dinner with with your family over childhood Mm -hmm. and poetry captures that kind of not quote fact it's certainly writing about reality it's about Mm -hmm. it's deeply real Mm -hmm. sometimes realer more real than a blueprint uh 
but it gets at that deep human felt experience and i think that's what poetry tries to capture in all its complexity so sometimes when people say oh i don't understand a poem well you know what do we mean by understand you don't understand a poem in the way that you understand a mathematical equation right. but if you understand a poem you, you understand it by living into it and having some sense of you know uh, of kind of replicated sense of an experience and for me that's you know what makes poetry particularly valuable and then we can move beyond that mm. forgive me i'm going on here a little bit do it, but, do it. but uh you know you can move beyond that to you know if it's distilled felt human experience then it can also be a study of comparative experience or a com com comparative humanity so when i'm reading a poem i can understand um be reminded of something for myself and Robert Frost, who you were just joking about, really a, actually a wonderful poet, you know, he said, you know, poetry is a way of rem remembering that which it would impoverish us to forget. I mean, so much of what we learn is re-remembering things we already know. So yeah. poetry can have that value of r making something that I already understand come back to me in a felt, deep yeah. way. Reminding us. Reminding us. Yeah. And it also can give us some experience we haven't had mm -hmm. but not in the way that someone says oh i just went to belarus mm -hmm. whatever but something that gives you a feeling of what it might be like to encounter belarus mm -hmm. so for me that's why poetry is so critical and so well, important and, and, I, and I think it helps us have the experience of living through the eyes and the soul of another and i find that I mean, yeah. you know, here I am at the stage of my life, I am not going to be traveling all over the world. I am not going to be meeting people from all over the world, but yet I can. When I read poetry, I get to do that. I get to see the, the world through somebody else's eyes. And that's exciting to me. Yeah. You know, it stretches me. It makes me be right. a bigger soul, um, a deeper soul. And um, I love that. And it doesn't cost me very much. I mean, poetry books, you know, not a lot of money is spent to, to right. travel the world and find out what other people's experiences are. I mean, one other thing I think I'd say, just to lay the groundwork, I mean, we've talked a lot about the sort of content of poetry, of poetry, what we experience through it. But there's another dimension, which is also the sort of music of it. And I'll just tell a little story from the first time somebody really introduced me to poetry. I was a medical, middle, middle school student, mm -hmm. and this very wonderful teacher brought in these mimeographed, I'm dating myself, but brought in these <laughs> mimeographed pages of this poem, this. <laughs> and it was this E.E. E. Cummings poem, and it, had, it was this wonderful poem. It was, anyone lived in a pretty how town with up so floating many bells down, and it had this refrain that was sun, moon, stars, rain, and I'm sitting there as a middle, middle school student. I didn't have a clue <laughs> what it was about. I didn't, quote, understand that poem. I was totally baffled by it. But there was so much music to it, mm -hmm. and I knew that there was something really deep going on there. So I think it's both these things. It's both the sort of physicality and musicality of it that attracts us, so that sometimes the poem we love, we love before we even begin to come to grips with its meaning. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, what really keeps me interested in poetry, if it was just about sound, that wouldn't probably make it for me. Mm -hmm. It's what Tears and I were already talking about, both the reminding ourselves yeah. of things we already know and getting new experience from other people mm -hmm. in a deeply felt human way. I also want to point out if anybody hears any rustling on the car, we have a <laughs> nice a we have a nice of pile of books of examples of the poetry they love right here. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> these are these are all examples of the ways Rick loves because he brought his books and I didn't bring mine. <laughs> well, we only have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So okay, so let's start with one of your favorite poems, Rick. Okay, well. Let me. Let me I'm gonna grab the books. I'm gonna fight over the books. I'm gonna start with one one of my one of my current favorite poets is a wonderful guy, uh, Frank Gaspar, and I'm gonna read this one poem. It's the title poem of a book that his um, book called Night of a Thousand Blossoms from Alice James Books, and I encourage you to go around, run out and buy that book. <laughs> um, but this poem is called One Thousand Blossoms. Or well, you can just take Rick's copy and I give it back to him. <laughs> uh, and this poem is called One Thousand Blossoms, and I think it touches on some of the things we were just mm -hmm. talking about. I love that poem. Well, 
Is it really wise to search for guidance in a small room, cluttered with books and papers, with a glass of whiskey and a box of wheat crackers, with my eyes ticking like the brass tide clock on the plaster wall? When the house sleeps huddled in the city's jasmine night, night of a thousand blossoms I can't name, night of a soft marine layer, Pacific fog hanging about a hundred yards up, a gauze, a parchment. I am hidden thus from my duties. I can escape the moral law. Isn't it written? Didn't Lord Krishna himself say that we mustn't relinquish the action we are born to, even if it is flawed? Didn't he say a fire is obscured by smoke? You can't see far into the city on a night like this, the blanket, the cool smell of the sea, the dampness that sits like velvet on the rose bushes and the African lilies and the fenders of the neighbor's truck. You don't want less love. This ground has been covered before. You want more love, even when you can't say what that means, even though it binds you to the world, which you can only lose. Then it is jasmine in the night, night of a thousand blossoms, and my wife in one room breathing, and my son in one room breathing, and me in one room breathing. It's how loving this place comes, slowly, then suddenly with great surprise, and then vanishing again into mystery. Am I dreaming all of this? Is that a train's long whistle riding the heavenly fog? Am I drunk again on holy books and the late hours? Now a car rolls down the street, filling it with light, then emptying it again. It's like that, just like that. And I think that's the kind of thing that poetry captures that nothing else can, the mystery of being yourself in one room and your wife in another room and a son in another room and you're very close and yet you're isolated individuals mm -hmm. and the way that coming upon a place, loving a place comes to you both suddenly and slowly, mm -hmm. but it also vanishes. Mm -hmm. And also the poem's ability itself to say, that's what it's like. It's like that. Mm -hmm. It's just like that. Mm -hmm. And when I read a poem I really love, I often find myself saying, oh. yeah, it's just like, <laughs> like that. that. Yeah, Frank is amazing that way. Yeah. Fabulous poet, fabulous poet. Um, pulls you into to, it's so evocative I mean just right there in that room yeah. you know in that silence yeah. everything is there and nothing is there just yeah. fabulous you know and if you don't understand his little riff on Lord Krishna okay you know you don't have to go understand everything no you know? and, and you know understanding one that gets us back in that narrow sense gets us back to this math equation right. and that's not the right way to approach it no and sometimes I'll read a poem and there's only a line that speaks to me, that just pops out at me and just slaps me across the face and says, that is what you want to be paying attention to today. And that's my day. And I'll go out in the day and that's what I'm paying attention to. Right. You know, and that's a gift. That's a real gift. So it doesn't matter what the rest of the poem was saying. It doesn't matter what, what, the, what the writer of the poem was trying to say. It matters what that I hear, what that I see. Um, and I what what you, did it invoke in me? I think you just said a word that's really important to poetry. And it's the, it's the word gift. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for a couple of reasons. One is when you're working on a poem, on one sense, it's really work. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of craft, a lot of going back and forth. And by the time you're done with a poem, you've got a whole stack of, you know, drafts of it mm -hmm. before you get something that you think is maybe ready to share with the world. Especially bigger, if you have a world. poet reading your poems and telling you the 50 different ways you could have done it. Well, and you couldn't are. think of any. <laughs> there, there are. You know, but... So on one sense, you know, it's hard work, it's craft, it's like cabinetry, you Absolutely. know. Um, but there's also another sense in which it's a, it's a gift because the things that often that really come alive in a poem, even one's un, own poem, mm. you go back two, later, two years later and you read it, the real test is you go back and read it and say, mm. wow, that really does capture something. Mm -hmm. and, and mostly the pieces that are resonant 
are ones you say, oh, I don't know where that came from, but that was good, <laughs> even your own mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's one level of gift, the, the sense in which the poet has of the poem is in a way a gift coming to them. And I don't mean some mystic sitting there and just dictating the words that come, but there is some sort of sure. listening that is a part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but there's also the, the gift that poetry is to us, you know, I mean, nobody's making money writing poetry, so it's really about <laughs> sharing, you know, and so, I can enjoy sharing a poem like the one we just read with a friend just as much as anything else. It's a gift to them. And when Tirza comes up and shares with me a poem that she really loves that I haven't heard, it's a gift mm-hmm. to me. And so I think that it's it's this business about the, the gift is really important. And when I turn to the poets that I love, the biggest thing I often, at my best, I, I think... Wow, I'm glad they did that because it was a gift to me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and you know, gifts are interactional because a gift isn't a gift unless it's received. Right. And so it's a communication. It's a relationship. So I don't know Frank. I, I've never met the man, right. but I do. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I know Frank's soul. Yes, and he would be... Uh, enlivened by your response because mm-hmm. there's not a real poem until there's right. A, right. a listener on the other side, you know. I mean, we'll go back into the, you know, deep past and mention the poet that people find scary, you know, yeah, because okay. it's one old name. But, you know, yeah. Wordsworth, okay, yeah. says, okay, you know, that reality is half created and half half perceived. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's real world out there. We're all bumping around in it. If we mm-hmm. ram into a door, we're going to feel something, you know. Yeah. We're not all going to feel the same thing, but, okay, mm-hmm. we're going to feel something. So, you know, there's, it's it's half perceived, but it's also half created. The way I look at a door mm-hmm. changes a door. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what you bring to Frank Aspar's poem or anyone else's mm-hmm. poem, Mary Oliver poem, mm-hmm. is... You know that creates something new, mm-hmm. and um, it's intangible, it is but intangible. it's real. It's real because if I read that poem, I would have read it slightly differently. Absolutely, because I would have read it the way it came into me. You read it the way it came into you, right. and that's what makes poetry just so magical. Yeah, it's and my analogy for that is it's like sheet music. Right. And a lot of times people will say, well, I just tried to read that poem and I didn't get it. You know, and they just give up. Okay. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in the same way that if someone handed me a piece of sheet music and said, oh, well, you know, here's a wonderful Bach cantata. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I would be totally clueless. Now, if someone reads a poem that's a performance or an interpretation, only one of many. Right. You know, mine was different from what yours right. would have been. Right. Um that's an, an interpretation, but it gives you something as a listener. You've heard an interpretation. Somebody's made the sentences hang together in their way, right. and it's not the same as just looking at the sheet music. Right. right. All right. So you're a poet. Okay. Um, what? How do you? How do you access that? That space, so that the gift can come to you. How do you do that? Wow. I mean, I. The, the truth is, if you really knew how to do it, you know, you'd write a lot more poems. <laughs> you know? you know? and, I, and I think, you know, there's, uh, I'm going to, I just keep go with anecdotes here all the time. But okay, there's a wonderful story about William Blake. He's in, his, he's in his older days, and he's starting to have, he's very poor still, but he's starting to have these people who are sort of like groupies, mm-hmm. kind of onto him, younger people. And uh, he's talking with one of them, and, one, and they're complaining, well, the inspiration has left me, you know, and he says, he, he and his wife, Catherine, they call each other Mr. Blake and Mrs. Blake. And, I, and he says, well, Mrs. Blake, what, what do we do when the, when the inspiration for, forsakes us, sometimes even for weeks at a time? And, he sa- and she says, we get down on our knees and pray, Mr. Blake. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, so in one sense, it's just being open and listen. But, but to, to answer more personally the, the question you asked me, um, you know, I usually will start by trying to read a little bit of somebody else's poems mm-hmm. just to get myself, you know, with sort of the hope that it can mm-hmm. be done, mm-hmm. you know, so it's not yeah. like, oh, just daunting, you know, if you listen, read yeah. a couple of poems and you go, boy, that was really, really good. You say, well, they did it. I can do it. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then I'll sort of start with a felt difficulty, usually something that I don't understand or something that's rubbing up against me that I, that I want to explore a little more that 
It seems like something that's mysterious to me. So some soul work. So, right? Some soul work. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah. Well, well put. Some yeah. soul work. And then uh, a big piece for me is just walking around outside mm -hmm. and walking in almost a zombie walk, very slow steps. I have a little route that I take where I don't have to make a lot of decisions. I'm not likely to get run over. Mm -hmm. And um, and there it's just very much listening and just sort of turning things over. And I'll think, well, something will come into my mind and I'll go, does that fit with what I'm working on? No, no, not that. And then I'll move on to something else will pop into my mind and I'll go, yeah, maybe that. Well, what about that? And I'll mm -hmm. sort of be with that for a little while and go, no, no, that's a dead end. And then I'll, you know, be on to the third thing and then maybe the first thing comes back again. So, But what I'm hearing you describe is a kind of act of listening that you do. That you're out in the world and you're listening to the world and then you're listening to your response in the world. You know, what's happening to me inside when I'm in this place? And then you're questioning that. What does this mean? And, and where am I going with this? You know, so it, it's really a very active process. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's, and a lot of the writing of the poetry th is happening in that experiential dance you're doing with with life and with, with where you are and not just sitting down and writing words on a piece of paper. Yeah. And, and believe everybody's got their own thing. Some people just start sort of free writing and mm -hmm. doing that kind of stuff. But for me, it's very much this mm -hmm. process of feeling my way toward a set of material, feeling, feeling, doing the, mm -hmm. what you're calling soul work. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a point where I feel like that's come enough together that, mm -hmm. that I feel like there's really something there and I'll get maybe a first line that sets the tone mm -hmm. for, the, for what's going to come and get the first really crappy draft done. And then it becomes after that, once you know, oh, I think I've got it there, mm -hmm. the material is kind of mm -hmm. in place. Then the stuff that feels more like carpentry or craft mm. comes in. You say, well, it could be this way, it could be that way. But at that point, mm. you sort of have something of a sense of, I've got something here or I don't. Yeah. You never are, know. Are you ever surprised about what comes out? Oh, absolutely. You, you hear about writers, novelists who, who um, you know, say, well, you know, I, I have an idea. And a lot of times they have the ending of the story. They have a kind of beginning, middle, end idea. But then they have these characters and they start writing the character and then the character becomes a life and that character dictates what the character wants to do and so the writer often finds the character is going in a direction the writer didn't necessarily plan because that just is what the character wanted to do and it, it sounds kind of funny that that this character has a life of its own but i wonder if ever a poem has a life of its own and that you're really in the, a role of maybe discovering it more than crafting it yeah um I'd say most poets that I talk to, friends who are poets, and I had the privilege to meet and, and some really fine poets, and most of them will say, "Well, when I start a poem, I have no idea where it's going." Okay. And and you know, mm -hmm. and I think my method is a little different. Not that I, when I start out walking and doing my soul work, I have no idea where it's going. Mm -hmm. But by the time I'm at the computer, I have some sense of where it's mm -hmm. it's going. But even there, you know, you'll be writing something in some detail will show up and you go oh that's very vivid that's that that <laughs> you know <laughs> well yeah, go follow that and, and it's and it's something that you where you say that's just how it is and and it's that very real thing that then you build off of mm -hmm. so yeah there are plenty of opportunities for surprises mm -hmm. you have an example of that you, you brought some of your own work um, I'll, I'll read one I'll okay. read one uh, sort of short poem and I mean sometimes poems can uh, come out of odd places sometimes you get like assignments mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm a member of a kind of a very progressive liberal presbyterian congregation and at one point our pastor who's a good friend said well rick you know what if every week you know for the next x weeks you know I'll do a sermon, you do a poem, blah, 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 and I'm going, deadlines, oh, oh no, deadlines, <laughs> you know, eight poems in eight weeks, you know, that's like breakneck pace for me, and, yeah. and a lot of them didn't come out very that well, and they're, they're going to be in my drawer, they were good mm -hmm. enough to share with a congregation. You're not going to submit friends, those to a publisher. But, but whatever. <laughs> But, you know, you know, out of the eight, one, uh, you know, you get one that I call a keeper, so I'm going to read the one keeper. of them. Okay. Um, and in the back, ground is you know I'm dealing with my mom is now 89 years old and is going through some Alzheimer's we don't have a formal diagnosis but she's definitely experiencing real dementia so this poem kind of gets at that a little bit but the, the poems called yet another resurrection appearance now that she's gone 
to live in another land of deep attunements and forgetfulness. I'm bathing my mother for the first time. She sits, still in sweatpants, on a metal stool in her shower stall. I work downward with an old soft cloth, cupping up warm water with my other hand. First, the knot of her neck, then her back, a mottled brown, the wing-like bones of her shoulder blades. Next, I soap the tender cup of her clavicle. Her breasts now, almost gone, loose and gently leathery. So thin, her ribs seem to count themselves through her skin. And the scar where they made the incision is smoother than a dime. Now that I've laved the silvery water on her skin, touched the bones of her wrists, the hollows of her palms, now that I've set my hand into the cusp smooth beneath each of her ghostly arms, how could I not believe? So in one sense, it's a poem that's clearly about, you know, bathing one's mother, but then you sort of ask yourself the question, well, what's this business about a resurrection appearance? And, mm -hmm. and again, you don't need to know this, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I was handed this, like, text, mm -hmm. and the text was about this um, piece of one of the gospel stories where um, it's the famous Doubting Thomas story where Thomas uh, comes back and, and he's meeting the resurrected you know, resurrected Christ which um, it's a that's a very mysterious thing because every time anybody claims to see them it's always a surprise like well we were eating dinner and suddenly I said oh that's you you know so I mean it's a very mysterious business you know but the, but the, what struck me was not anything so supernatural about this story but the intimacy of it you know Thomas is touching Jesus's side He's asking him to touch his palms, just the intimacy of all this mm -hmm. touching and the depth and the sort of religious, there's something intimate and religious about that in all of our touching. Mm -hmm. And that was the sort of real jumping off point mm -hmm. for this poem. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Neat. I like it a lot. Wow. So, okay. So. Do we want to talk about this course? Let's talk about the course. Yeah. Okay. Let's all talk right. about the course. So. We're we're planning a a uh, a course a yeah I guess it's really more a course than a workshop uh, yeah. a course in uh, healing. yeah course is a bad word yeah. course makes it sound like you know it's gonna be hard work there's gonna be assignments <laughs> no it's soul work it's, is there gonna be homework no no well yeah <laughs> <laughs> self assigned homework not no grades <laughs> you can't you can't fail this um, it's a it's a, a five week um, group course. Workshop, whatever you want to call right. it. Um, what are we calling it? <laughs> Called <laughs> Embracing Mystery, Experiencing Mastery, Healing with Poetry. Um, so what we want to do is is get together and look at poetry as, as a vehicle for the soul work that we have to do in the world. And uh, so we're, we're hoping to, to gather about eight to ten people to come uh, on Monday evenings from 7 to 8.30, starting on January 9th, here at St. Clair. And we've got a wonderful room uh, with a log-burning fireplace, so it's uh, poetry and fire, the best combination ever, to come together and um, explore ourselves, explore our, our life's journey, and uh, where that journey may have taken us that's left us maybe with some, some healing to do. Uh, because uh, so much of poetry, because it is soul work, comes from a poet's grappling with the things that hurt, the things that uh, um, that uh, damage, you know, the things that, that leave us with questions and with uh, uh, with with queries we don't always know how to answer. Um, so uh, there's a lot of poetry that that can can you know help us in that that quest to to, to wholeness. Right. I mean, we're going to be gathering people, and it's going to be some conversations and um, some reflection, mm -hmm. and also some poems, but not poems mm -hmm. in the sense of like 
we're going to sit down and wrestle them down. It's right, going to be right, poems right. as sort of shared experience. Mm -hmm. And um, that the other thing I'd say is it's not going to be a writing workshop. Right. Um, it's really sort of a, an opportunity for shared exploration with poetry is just one of the tools we're mm -hmm. going to be using right. for that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if, if somebody is a writer, that's... That's fine, but that's going to be not going to be the main focus of it. Right, that's not the main focus, and, and certainly that, you know, that may come into it. Someone may want to share a poem of their own as a, a way of, uh, you know, how they're they're doing their work. Um, but we'll be looking at, at other poets. We've got tons of them, and our, our favorites as well as other people's favorites. Uh, but the 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 point is to is to um, to embrace the mystery. What what is the mystery of living, and uh, uh, and how do we master? you know, the dance with that mystery. Uh, can we do that? So that's what we're looking to do. Yeah. Um, so we encourage uh, those of you, if you're interested in poetry, if you think anything we've said today resonates for you and uh, you're, you're intrigued and you want to join us, uh, please uh, give us a call. You can uh, email me at... Uh, at what is my email address here? Um, well, you can email me at yeah, Mike at Seclair.com, <laughs> and I'll forward it across. But yeah, okay, Mike yeah. at Seclair.com. Uh, See, Mike for, is, the, is the, this guy. If you have so any more questions <laughs> and, or anything like that. I have uh, my head in a poetry book. I don't know how to do And, of course, the information will be up on Seclair.com, of right. course, as, as we get closer to the yeah, And as Tirza said, this mm -hmm. can be, you know, just sort of life experience that you're healing from. It could be somebody who's had a difficult diagnosis and is thinking right. about that or right. somebody who's in a kind of extended recovery mode. Right. But it or can be all of that. who's exploring, who, right. who's discovered right. that the poetry may be a way of accessing their own soul uh, differently than they have in the past. Right. Right. And we're all going to be learning from each other. Right. So exactly. it's going to be a mutual a, learning experience. It's not a mechanics of poetry no, class. No, right. we're not going to be doing literary analysis. <laughs> you know, right. we're not going to be deciding this is a good poem, that's a bad poem. We're going to be looking at poetry as a way in, in fact, and I, a way out. Mm -hmm. I think of this in a way as a gathering of traveling companions. I mean, mm -hmm. we're all on a journey toward wholeness and healing in our lives, and it's a journey that just keeps going, you know, mm -hmm. and we all have companions. And the, and we, in the group, we'll be companions with each other, but also we're going to be bringing in poets who will be companions along with us. Hey, Ed, at the beginning, I don't know if it was before uh, we recorded or not, I think I, I saw the pile of books you guys had and, and <laughs> referred to this as a book club. Is this, <laughs> well, you guys are kind of proposing a, a poetry club here. Almost, in a, yeah, in a sense. Um, I was thinking about Marie Howe's uh, poem, What the Living Do. Yeah. This may be a good poem to, good. to, to end if I can read this. Okay. Um, all right. It's called What the Living Do by Marie Howe. Johnny, the kitchen sink has been clogged for days. Some utensil probably fell down there. And the draino won't work, but smells dangerous, and the crusty dishes have piled up, waiting for the plumber I still haven't called. This is the everyday we spoke of. It's winter again. The sky's a deep, headstrong blue, and the sun sunlight pours through the open living room windows because the heat's on too high in here, and I can't turn it off. For weeks now, driving or dropping a bag of groceries in the street, the bag's breaking. I've been thinking, this is what the living do. And yesterday, hurrying along those wobbly bricks in the Cambridge sidewalk, spilling my coffee down my wrist and sleeve, I thought it again. And again later, when buying a hairbrush, this is it. Parking, slamming the car door shut in the cold, what you call what you called that yearning, what you finally gave up. We want the spring to come and the winter to pass. We want whoever to call or not call, a letter, a kiss. We want more and more and then more of it. But there are moments walking when I catch a glimpse of myself in the window glass, say the window of the corner video store, and I'm gripped by a cherishing so deep for my own blowing hair, chapped face, an unbuttoned coat that I'm speechless. I am living. I remember you. Mm -hmm.